I'm going to actually uh, start the program. So let me just share out a screen and we'll get started. All right, let's let's talk about uh, prior to the fair opening. Um, the fair was held in the same place um, out in Queens in Flushing Meadows that the 1939 World's Fair was held. Um, it's, it had 1,200 acres. Um, and originally, back in the 1930s, uh, that area was uh, swampland, but they covered it up with fill in the 30s for uh, Flushing Meadows Park. And then they drove wood pilings into the soil to support um, concrete and steel buildings of the original uh, World's Fair buildings. And they used wood because they didn't think uh, everything would be around forever and it's cheaper and they could get it in. For this fair, um, they decided it was going to be more, they needed to raise money, obviously. Um, and there were a couple of problems they ran into. it. So they actually brought up a, or formed a corporation, a private corporation. And New York businessmen, because they figured it'd be a good way, the fair would be good to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the 1939 World War. And they hired, the corporation hired, Robert Moses. And I'm sure you've heard Robert Moses's name and we'll come back to him in a second. He was gonna head the corporation to run the fair and to raise private money, bond sales, things like that. Um, the organizers, as I said, turned to private financing and the sales of bonds to stage the event. Um, now, the one thing that they needed, and we'll come to that in a second, was that international expositions were sanctioned by a, 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 a um, group of people called the Bureau of International Expositions. They had certain rules. Um, a fair could last only six months. Um, 64, 65 was gonna last two years. And that was done because they needed to uh, raise or actually make from the sale of everything $70 million to make a break even point. So they said, oh, we can't do that in a year with customers and you'll see why, um, but we will do it over two years. So number one, the BI, the B, I can never say this right, but the BIE, uh, which was headquartered in Paris, wasn't happy about that, number one. Um, the other reason was there's only supposed to be in a country, every 10 year period, one World's Fair. Well, Seattle had one in 1962, which meant New York could not have one in 64. So Robert Moses went over to Paris um, and to speak to the BIE. Now, you know, the um, US was not a member of the BIE, but you know, if they got the BIE on their side, that would guarantee that all the member countries in the BIE would show at the World's Fair. Um, he got there, he tried to get their approval. And when the BIE um, balked at New York's bid, Moses, who, if many of you know who Robert Moses is, he expected always to get his way. Um, he decided he, I'm gonna go to the press about, you know, uh, how unfair everybody is being to me. And uh, so what happened? The BIE retaliated. And they said, formally, uh, we told, they told their members, guess what? You cannot participate in the New York Fair. So the New York 64-65 World's Fair is the only 
significant World's Fair since the formation of the BIE to be held without its endorsement. So in front of you here, you see a layout as construction was going on. Um, I was able to kind of figure out a few things. This building, let me get my mouse here, if it's working, there it is. This building here was the gas company's building. People from, you know, some buildings, a lot of them were shared. Uh, so this was the gas company's building. Um, over here was the GE pavilion. And I really could not see, figure out a lot of these other buildings. Um, President Kennedy. And that's Mayor, I think it was Mayor Robert Wagner at the time at New York City. And there's Robert Moses, and we'll come back to him. Um, Kennedy, this was in 1962, groundbreaking. Kennedy was there, made a quick little speech. Um, and this was the groundbreaking for the U.S. Pavilion. Um, they came up with the theme for peace for understand, peace through understanding as the theme for the fair. And as I said, this is in December 14th, 1962, and Kennedy, unfortunately, would not live till 1964 to ever attend the fair. And this is pretty much the only time he really got to go to the fair. Now we'll come back to Robert Moses standing in front of the fair. If you do not know the story of Robert Moses, we'll just give you a quick little uh, primer on him. He was called the master builder. He headed co corporations in the city, gave them titles. But if you ever travel in, in New York over a lot of different places, such as the Triborough Bridge or the Verrazano Bridge or the Throgsnick Bridge or the Whitestone Bridge or the Queens Midtown Tunnel, among other things, um, he headed those projects, <laughs> pardon me, um, had a reputation for getting what he wanted, obviously. He didn't care about stepping on people or uh, for lower class neighborhoods if he wanted to build a highway. Well, eminent domain was his way of getting them. And, you know, they're, they had problems. That's well, that was their problem. Now, the one thing that happened that I remember, and I looked it up, was when New York had two National League baseball teams back in the 50s, the Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Giants. The owner of the Dodgers, Walter O'Malley, he wanted to replace their ballpark in Brooklyn, which was Epics Field. It was old. It was falling apart. And O'Malley wanted to use an area on Atlantic and Flatbush, Flatbush Avenues which is right near where the Barclays Center is now in Brooklyn. Well, Moses didn't want to help him out. He, wanted, he went to Moses to try to get that, but Moses had other ideas, and Moses wanted to use that area to build a garage there. So he turned him down, and he proposed, well, you can move out to Queens, and he's going to use the Queens area. Well, guess what happened? It's all history, obviously. When they couldn't get an agreement, O'Malley worked out a deal with Los Angeles, where the Dodgers have been ever since. And the other team's owner, the New York Giants owner, Horace Stoneham, followed suit and moved to San Francisco. So if you want to blame someone for baseball, National League baseball, leaving New York until uh, 1962 when the Mets started, we can give that blame to Robert Moses. Well, the fair, once it got started, it had uh, slow progress, but it had progress. Everything is booming out Flushing Meadows Way, where the New York World's Fair shows graphic signs of progress. The news of the day camera, aloft in a helicopter, focuses on the $17 million federal pavilion. Its theme, challenge to greatness. The New York State Pavilion, 
1,600 foot high concrete columns will support the tent of tomorrow. The Port Authority heliport will be operational by October, six months before the fair's April 64 opening. The air gateway to the fair is but one means of access. By railroad and subway, via marina and arterial approaches, the millions of visitors can come to the fair. Many highways will converge on the site. What they will see is a dramatic presentation of the new and changing world, industry and progress, housed in $500 million worth of exhibits. William A. Shea Stadium, new home of the Mets and scene of next year's all-star baseball game. Finishing the job of constructing the stainless steel unisphere, the fair symbol, dramatizing the interrelation of the peoples of the world and their hopes for peace through understanding. So as you can see, that was construction in 1963 and it moved along. Some of the construction was not ready on time. Um, and as the fair moved between 64 and 65, a few things were also changed. But, you know, here's where the fair was. Now, I'm sure many of you, if not all, have been out by in Flushing by now City Field, where Shea Stadium was, or U.S. Open Tennis is in the, air, in the area. But as you can see right here in Queens is the site that they held the fair at, both in 39 and in 64 or 65. Obviously, there is JFK Airport, there's Times Square, and there's where the Statue of Liberty. So we would be up here someplace in New Jersey. So as construction went along, you can see this shows um, the Unisphere on this side, and which was 12 stories high, and this is as you can tell, and there's a gentleman working up on top here. That's the IBM building. And we're gonna, I'll explain later when we're going through some of the individual sites, why, why they use that shape and why uh, IBM was on it. So it, here's the fair upon completion. There's the Unisphere, obviously, and you have the you have the pool here, you have people getting around on both sides of the highway. I believe that's the Grand Central Highway. But some of the things that you would have here is this, and I think you might be able to tell from the design on the roof, that's the Chrysler building, or the Chrysler building, the Chrysler Pavilion, the Chrysler buildings remained in Manhattan. Over here was transportation and travel. Made sense with the Chrysler building. This is the General Foods Arch. Um, as I said, that's the Grand Central Expressway. The Unisphere. Um, the New York State Pavilion was over here. You can always tell there's the pavilion, there are restaurants in here and you could view the fair from there. This small grouping here, and not so small grouping, is the Africa Pavilion. Um, this is more the international area. This is the Philippines Pavilion. And over here was Indonesia. And also, so this was really the whole international section. You had, in, you had countries, you had certain states that were um, represented by the big majority of the um, buildings and the displays came from the corporate world, especially in the United States, because of the BIE saying 40 countries couldn't come, their members couldn't come, uh, corporate really stepped in. So here's a, a comp, uh, you can compare the 1939 World's Fair here with the 64, 65 World's Fair. I'm just gonna call it the 64 World's Fair. 
Um, I always forget this. The pi. What is it? I always get the names like the perisphere and then, then, but this is so it was it had it's the highway as you can see, but they was on the same grounds. Um, the one in thirty nine was really more of an international exposition, um, but unfortunately thirty nine was the last World's Fair for quite a while because of the war that broke out which eventually became World War II. All right, so getting there, this is, a, I found a subway map, and this is in blue because getting there, you could go from Times Square to the number, on the number seven train, which still exists today. You take the number seven train if you want to go to City Field from Times Square. Uh, prices change, but it goes all the way. It goes to Flushing Meadows and beyond. But that they had the fare back in '64 was 15 cents. Um, obviously, things were a bit less expensive back in 1964. But it, it was a quick trip. It probably took like 20, 25 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. But it only made certain stops, and it was a was something called the um, it's special, you know, the, the pair special. It had certain trains that were turquoise and, and gray or white. Um, and they used what were called bluebird cars um, by the company that manufactured. And they, they paint them up so you knew you were on the right car. The nice part about the number seven train, if you have not taken it, and I took it a lot um, when I would go to Shea Stadium or when I went to the World's Fair with my friends um, is that once you come out of Manhattan, you becomes an elevated section of train. So you are above ground. You're no longer real subway. You can see everything, which is kind of cool. You know, just like they used to have the Second Avenue L in Manhattan where you still have trains in the Bronx uh, that are above ground, you get to see more, and it's, and it's a lot of fun. And, you know, they, they promoted it heavily to get people to come. Transit Authority has 430 spanking new picture window cars for the elevated ride to the World's Fair. Express trains start at Times Square and Grand Central and you're safely at the fair in less than 20 minutes. Take it easy. Take the subway. Yes, part of the fun of the World's Fair is the subway special that takes you there. So, yes, uh, as I say, it took 20 minutes or so to get to the World's Fair by the subway. Um, I do remember being in the subway car and I guess these two actors in the car had something I didn't see usually in the subway car, which was a police officer, it looked like in the back, number one. And number two, I remember the cars being a lot more crowded. So it's like not everybody uh, had a seat and you were kind of at times shoulder to shoulder. But that was not the only way you could get there. If you were coming from, um, other areas such as Long Island, just, they had their own subway, they had not subway, a train car. They called it the World Fair Special. And if you were coming from the island or any place that the uh, Long Island Railroad ran, you could take that train there also. Didn't live in the city, didn't live in Long Island, didn't have a chance to go use mass transportation. Could, they had parking, yes sir. And this is a parking shot from May 1964. 
So it is about a month after the World's Fair opened. And you can see um, it was pretty crowded. I didn't find the, the cost of parking, but again, relatively cheap as compared to today. Here we go. We have the uh, New York State Pavilion and Towers over here. Um, and I like this picture more so because of the cars themselves. Yeah, we got a BW bus, the way the station wagons looked back then. And there were a bunch of them. And then we got the fins on this car. Um, and the other thing you notice, and you'll notice in the picture, if you went to a World's Fair today, if they had one, and this used, the fair season usually ran from April through October. So you're about six months. Um, if you went to a World's Fair or any exposition today, you would dress very casually, you know, shorts if it was cold, hot out or stuff. More people, and again, if you went to ball games back in the 60s, a lot of people uh, were dressed casually, but not in shorts. They'd be in shirts and pants, and some people would be in uh, ties if they were coming from work. But this, you'll see a lot of the stuff in here. You'll see people dressed uh, the way people went out back at that period. All right, so you, you, you've, you've taken the subway, you've taken the uh, train. I'm sure there was a bus to get you there. You've driven there. Well, you're not getting in for free. They've got to make that money uh, to have a break even point. So you had to buy a ticket. And here's a ticket from the 1964 Five Worlds Fair. And as you can see, the adult ticket was $2. And if you were a child, you would be playing $1. All right, so I, I looked some stuff up. Um, and the $2 ticket back then, if it was the same price today, or it came in today's money, you would be paying about $17 for a daily ticket to get it, which when you think about it is still very cheap. I don't know how much I haven't been to World Disney World since the 90s, but I'm sure a daily pass is a lot more than 17 bucks. Um, the child's ticket would be about 850 today. Um, the one thing I noticed on this that the Unisphere, which is the main focal point, was uh, presented by USS Steel, United States Steel Corporation. And obviously they probably used a lot of steel to make it. Here's opening day. It was April 22nd, 1964. And it did not look like the weather-wise the nicest day of the fair. They had showers in the morning. The high temperature that day was 47 degrees and the low, of course they stayed open late. I think they stayed open till like 2 a.m. Um, was 41 degrees. Um, and they had about uh, less than a quarter of an inch of rain that day. But you know, you'll notice people have some umbrellas on there. Uh, let's see, we have some an umbrella there, but it was more showery, but it was damp out. But that held down the crowd for opening day uh, to less than the, what they expected. But um, I found the video. It goes about seven minutes about opening day. So uh, but let's take a look at it. Soaring 12 stories above the New York World's Fair, the stainless steel Unisphere makes its official debut as symbol of the most ambitious exposition that man has ever attempted. Set in 646 acres, the Billion Dollar Show opens its doors to an expected 70 million people. Already, 29 million tickets have been sold. Opening day rain cut the number of visitors drastically, only 92,000 against an expected quarter million. But it's only the beginning, folks. It's only the beginning. has taken as its theme man's achievements in an expanding universe. Its purpose, an ambitious one, peace through understanding. 66 foreign nations are represented, including 24 African countries that didn't exist a few years ago. The official ceremonies begin with the inaugural parade, 
marches bravely ignoring the rain and paying homage to the old cliché, the show must go on. And go on it does. This is the successful fruition of a dream that began six years ago when the germ of the idea was born. A germ that was nurtured to today's grand climax, the greatest fair ever constructed by man. Winds its way down the avenue, fair officials led by President Robert Moses can take pride in their schedule. The fair is 85% completed, a remarkable record. Of 139 pavilions, only 17 are not fully ready. At the fair stadium, an invited audience, many didn't brave the weather, await the arrival of President Johnson to dedicate the fair that his predecessor, John F. Kennedy, helped inaugurate. It was a busy day for the President. A quick trip to New York, and an even quicker return to Washington, where he kept his hectic day by announcing an agreement that sidetracked a railroad strike. The president greets VIPs on the platform before his speech. He predicted a bright future for the nation and for the world. A chilled wind springs up, but the president warms his audience with a quip about the fair's president, Robert Moses. First, however, he strikes a serious note. This fair represents the most promising of our hopes. It gathers together from 80 countries the achievements of industry, the health of nations, the creation of man. This fair shows us what man at his most creative and constructive is capable of doing. And so I took my leave of what Ogden Nash has called the promised land of Mr. Moses. Hoping and trusting that in the future, it will not take anyone 40 years to reach it. Thank you very much. Now the New York World's Fair of 1964 is open, and the president is in a jovial mood as he presses the scores of hands thrust towards him. be a World's Fair without offering a world tour right here in New York. Want to visit Hong Kong? The international area offers a sampling of life in countries many of us never even hoped to visit. You can go east to Pakistan, and when you've seen everything there, detour to Japan. Then a side trip to Thailand, and after that, it's on to India. After a leisurely visit in the Philippines, across the seas to Berlin. And then back to Hollywood and all of the glamour of the movie capital. When night falls, be prepared for a symphony of light, color, and music. It's as if the grounds were touched by the magic wand of some beneficent fairy who painted a wonderland that looks like a frosted cake here, like a delicate building blocks of a never-never land there. Mountains come to light, they mount a shimmering curtain that rises and falls in great crescendos. Standing proudly is the Unisphere, bathed in light and reflecting the exploding fireworks as they reach toward the heavens. Then is the New York World's Fair. Grand in its concept, it stands as a mighty milestone in men's search for a world that should be. So, before we go any further, anybody have any comments before we start touring the fair or anything they'd like to say? 
Uh, if you noticed in the video of the parade, you saw a lot of, you saw Pinocchio and other Disney characters because Disney had a big part in a lot of the expositions there. And we'll, we'll see some of them, but uh, he was part of not only, um, say, Ford, but he was also part of Pepsi-Cola and a few other things. And, and he introduced uh, animatronics during the fair. Anything before I move on about getting around the fair? Well, these getting around, these were called the Swiss Sky Ride. As you can see, uh, the gondolas went above. It's about 112 feet in the air. And they traversed the international section of the fair, as you can say, uh, from the buildings. Um, and there was about a ride that was about 2,000 feet long and lasted about five minutes. And the cars itself were built by a Swiss company called Von Roll uh, out of Switzerland. Now, once the fair ended, um, they, with a lot of the exhibitions and things like that were going to be just dismantled. That was the end. A lot of the stuff went to other places, and I'll show you a few of them. But anybody want to venture a guess where these gondolas in the air wound up? Can't you see this? Pardon me? How about Disney World? Nope, not Disney World. Nope. Closer. Think closer. Closer. Palisades? Nope. Um, great Adventure? Great Adventure. Yep. Um, they they were uh, bought actually the the sky ride now in gate well in back then uh, in Great Adventure they used the cars um, and I think they started using them in the seventies and eventually in nineteen in the nineteen eighties um, cars were replaced. Those were replaced by cars from, um, from Georgia and other places from Illinois, from Great Adventures Place in Illinois they came from, not great, not Georgia, but Great Adventures Theme Park in Illinois. And all but um, of the original cars are gone now, except for two of the original World Fair cards, which are have no roofs now and they're used for maintenance cars but for some reason if you ever go to a great adventure now see if somebody will show you the maintenance cars because uh those cars are what uh close to 60 years old so you can get around on the sky ride how else can you get around well amf you remember amf for the people who bring you uh bowling alleys they had the monorail which was cool. I remember going on it. The nice part of it was, okay, it was air conditioned. So if you were there on a hot day, it uh, rode around about 40 feet and it was in the lake area of the fair. Um, there were seven two-car monorails that ran on a three-quarter of a mile track route and they stopped at different stations. And it was open from 9 a.m. to 2 a.m. So it was <laughs> a long day. I'm sure they had different shifts. And they did not, they were not free. If you wanted to ride the monorail, and I don't, couldn't find if you could just stay on the monorail for as long as you want. I'm kind of thinking they didn't throw you off. <laughs> but if you were an adult, you paid 80 cents. And if you were a kid, you paid 20 cents less, you paid 60 cents. I mean, the, the, and the main way of getting around the fair was on your two feet. And that's what most people did. All right, so I'm going to show you a representative. Uh, first, we're gonna go through the international section. 
and I'll show you some of the exhibits and countries that displayed during the World's Fair and what they did. And then we'll move over to the US side and the corporate side and what went on. So we remember before we saw that from the area of the African village and you have a little blurb down there. It says the African Pavilion gave the continent's emerging nations an opportunity to be part of the World's Fair. Um, back in the 60s, prior to the 60s, I should say, a lot of the countries in Africa were um, colonies, whether French, English, Dutch. And during the 60s, they, through either peaceful means or through, unfortunately, um, civil wars or, or, or not civil wars, but you know, they were fighting the French in, in certain places or Belgio, um, Belgian Congo, they got their independence. And the African pavilion uh, represented 24 nations. You had to pay to get in, but you didn't have to pay to see each place. It cost you a uh, dollar as an adult to get into the pavilion and 50 cents in, as a child. And these round huts, which you see here, and we saw in the other picture, um, that's what the village basically was. It was a, excuse me, a um, representation, representation of round huts. And they had a museum, which uh, was showed a collection of folk art. Uh, it did have a places you could buy uh, souvenirs, um, souvenirs, everything from a five cent postcard to a $500 diamond, if you wanted to buy it. So you had a little bit of everything. Um, as you came into the actual African village, uh, main gate, it had cages of animals from Africa. I don't know if they came directly from Africa or the zoo someplace in the United States, but they had animals such as lions and tigers and leopards and other animals representative of um, Africa. And of course they had restaurants. Every seems like most pavilions had a restaurant of one sort or another. Um, here they had a restaurant with uh, caged birds that as you were eating, you could do it. And they had waiters dressed in tribal um, outfits, and they also had in an open air entertainment center within the village, they had tribal dancers uh, representing either different countries or different tribes. And one of the things you could buy is this medallion. Again, on a rope of some type, I do not know the uh, cost, but this is something in one way or another when you go to places on vacation or go other places. Uh, a lot of people buy just as a remembrance of it. You know, you could go to, I don't know, Aruba. You could, might come back with a necklace saying Aruba, or you go to uh, Lake George. You might get it. This was representative. Couldn't find pricing. Uh, I, I didn't know the exact price or the close price of what it was then, um, but you can always look in um, eBay and they still sell them or eBay or other places, but the price is not representative of what it was in 64. All right, besides Africa, Belgium was there. Now, Belgium was the was a copy right in here. You can see the, all the buildings surrounding it. It was a copy of a walled Flemish Belgian uh, village. It was the largest of all the exhibits in the international area. It had over a hundred houses. It had a represent a, a 15th century church representation. It had a city hall with a rascaler under it. So of course, they were back to drinking and eating. It had a canal with a arched stone bridge and it, it was about four acres uh, that it comprised. 
Um, it didn't open when the fair opened, as they said that uh, not 100% of the exhibits were ready for the opening in April. This opened in August. So it was a few months later. Um, and the reason it opened late, well, they had funding delays, which led to construction delays. Um, within the uh, area, probably inside the town, I won't call it a square, they did do shows. They had folk dancing. They had an 1898 carousel, but I'm not sure where they had that. And of course, you can, I'm going to keep saying on and off, you could buy things representative of the Belgian culture, handicrafts, jewelry, uh, anything that you like. But that was not the biggest draw of Belgium. In 1964, Belgium, or the actual uh, exhibit in Belgium introduced something to Americans and those who came to the fair. It was 50 years ago today that the 1964-65 World's Fair opened in New York. Among the most memorable exhibits were Bell Systems Picture Phone, Michelangelo's Pieta at the Vatican Pavilion, and an undersea world at GM's Futurama. But the surprise hit of the fair was the Belgian waffle in its American debut. The waffles sold like hotcakes, 2,500 a day. So I had never knew until I started doing research that that's where, you know, I, I've always seen Belgian waffles. I don't like Belgian waffles, but I'm not a big whipped cream fan. That's why, but okay, it's a waffle. It's got whipped cream, it's got strawberries. People like it, but um, that's where it was introduced in the United States at the 64 World's Fair. All right, you had the Berlin um, exhibition. Now, Berlin at that time was uh, East Berlin and West Berlin. Now, Berlin was such, uh, situated actually in East Germany and West Berlin was um, the American, French, it was the free world zone and East Germany and East Berlin was controlled by the East Berlin who were uh, allied with the Russians. So this was a privately sponsored uh, by a West Berlin marketing council. And this tent here was made of flexible plastic. Um, and it displayed the um, culture, the pro products of West Berlin. It actually had an exhibit on the Berlin walls and it had um, a newsreel or movie that showed events in Berlin. Again, probably West Berlin. And this one was free. And again, as we see here, and look, someone's wearing shorts. I said, no one wore shorts. Um, you, there was always a lot of seating areas that if you were seating, and again, you didn't have to be buying something from there, you could sit down just like most places have these days. Nearby, Philippines. Um, it, was, it, it stood out because it, looked like something you know, like one of the hats the Filipinos would wear. Um, like most places, it had folk dancing, it had music, so they were representing the culture of the country. It had wood carvings of the country. And on the second floor, so you got the first floor here, second floor, guess what they did there? They sold things. You had mostly handicrafts that people would buy. So, I mean, if you, again, it didn't cost a lot to get in. Didn't really cost a lot to travel to get there. Um, again, most people were not making the money they make these days. But um, you could come home with a lot of things if you chose wiping. There's the uh, Swiss, car, Swiss cars again flying over the international section. 
All right, you have Spain. Now, Spain was a little, we did a little more culture. I broke it down into two sections. Here you've got the art of Spain. Um, this is a Goya. This over here is a Velasquez uh, painting. And this looks like one of the Spanish guard who was stationed there, but they had a lot of uh, art in what they call the sacred hall of art. So it's more towards the, the, the culture and the art of Spain. They also had works um, from Picasso, from Salvador Dali, and other artists who were from Spain. And the, the actual building itself were three buildings and they attached them. They were attached buildings. They had three different buildings. And then of course, they had a restaurant patio. So we got people who can sit and eat and during uh, times during the day, um, there was folk dancing of Spain. And there were three, actually there were three restaurants so people could watch uh, folk dancing while they were eating. Now this one was Taiwan. Now Taiwan uh, is still Taiwan, but it's not the People's Republic of China. That was the communist China. This was the island that the nationalists were forced to after the civil war in mainland China in the late 1940s. And this was one of the most photographed buildings at the fair. Again, we got the Swiss car rides, but this building right here was red and gold. And it was, the pavilion was a reproduction of a traditional imperial palace. Um, and it was erected in the United States. They brought stuff over and they erected it there. Um, as I said, it was one of the most photographed pavilions at the fair because of the obviously being picturesque, but also it faced the unisphere. So if people who were by the unisphere sphere, uh, went any place, they probably went here first because it stood out. Um, they had exhibits, obviously, as everyone else did there. Um, they showed exhibits of ancient and modern Chinese cultures. They had art objects, um, jades, they showed silks, they showed carvings. And as I said, it's a, it's a big draw. And I'm sure a lot of people uh, were photographed uh, by the building. Um, we have Thailand. As you saw in the, as they were constructing things at the, for the opening day, Thailand was, if you've ever watched The King and I, uh, which was set in Thai, Siam, which became Thailand, you would see, you know, it looked like that. Um, the main building, um, it showed 18th century Buddhist shrine. Uh, it had a spired roof, as you can see it going up here. I couldn't get it all in. Uh, and it went up to about 80 feet high. Um, the roof was built in Thailand, shipped to the US and assembled at the fair. So a lot of, a lot of the exhibits, portions, or in, in case some, all of it um, were made in the originating country and then it was shipped to the United States. And later on, we're gonna see something else that I think was the biggest ship uh, items and they were made in the United States, but how they came to the fair was very interesting, but I'm not telling you what that is. It also showed here, this is representative of arts and crafts of the ancient Siam and the modern Paya. Um, and it also attracted large crowds, it was free. Um, and it was not the biggest of displays, but it drew big crowds. And I think part of that is, you know, the architecture and the um, exhibits that they showed. Now, here's one of the probably the most visited 
uh, exhibits was the Vatican. Um, and it was one of the most popular uh, of all attractions at the World's Fair. <clears throat> Excuse me. Actually, when they broke ground to start building the Vatican um, exhibit, it was televised by the Vatican and Pope John XXIII, who was the Pope at the time, he pushed a button, pushed a button in his Vatican apartment uh, to start the pile drivers at the New York construction site. So it was a big thing, not only at the fair, but it was very uh, important uh, for, the, for the Vatican. Anybody have a idea of what the main attraction at the Vatican Pavilion was? That would have to be the Pietà. Ah, the Pietà it was. There it is. Uh, it's Michelangelo's Pietà. Um, it was done in 1498-99. And it was lent to the Vatican. Obviously, they were not going to say, oh, yeah, keep it dead. Um, but interest, I mean, it, it, a lot of people came to see it, but what I found, what I, um, what I found very interesting is that it was, they were worried, obviously, well, we got to ship it. How are we shipping it to the United States for, to go to Flushing Meadows to be at the fair? Well, it was shipped in a wooden crate that was two and a half inches thick and had an eight inch base. Okay, well. Put it on a boat, it'll send. Well, you know, uh, what happens if there's trouble on the ship? Well, it was secured to the deck of the ocean liner, which was the Cristofo Colombo. And it had something even more. God forbid the ship had, it's not going to run into an iceberg, but had problems and the ship went down. Um, in case of the accident, the crate had cushioning thick enough to float. Um, it had an emergency locator beacon and it had a marker buoy. So obviously, you know, this being one of the most priceless art objects in the world, they were not taking any kind of chances with it. Um, and how people would come into the building and they would view it, maybe on a moving conveyor belt. Just, you know, I would think it's similar to the moving stairs at the airports these days, but that's how they would do it. So it's like, you know, you, you couldn't stand in front of it the whole time. And the Vatican, <clears throat> excuse me, the Vatican had other um, objects to art and things about the Vatican. And it also had stained glass that was put in into the Vatican convention. Um, and that's one thing, stained glass from that pavilion that you're not gonna just demolish and throw away. I found that, that's the stained glass from the Vatican, Vatican <clears throat> Pavilion. Excuse me one second. I get a cough drop so I don't lose my voice. Um, <coughs> after the World's Fair, um, it was purchased um, in, uh, for a church built in Connecticut, in Groton, Connecticut. So if you go to St. Mary's Church in Groton, Connecticut, you can see the original stained glass from the Vatican Pavilion today. And they also, I'm not sure I didn't see what, but they also uh, purchased other interior and exterior equipment from the Vatican Pavilion. Didn't say what. I'm not sure. I, Groton, if I remember, Groton, Connecticut is on the eastern end of, of Connecticut as you're going up to Rhode Island, out by New London, stuff like that. So, I mean, if, if, if you're going up that area and you can find your way to the church, it would be a very interesting thing to see. Uh, there were a lot of other pardon me, other um, international displays, many countries, but I tried to pick the most interesting ones I could find. 
Any questions before we, or comments before we go on? The Pieta is the most memorable thing for my wife and I from, from the World's Fair. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's so stunning when you're going through it. I, I know I saw it. I mean, I'm sure that it, the, you know, the, it was set in a, um, not a big bright room. So as you're going by, you will feel the sense of it too. And I I'm think so, it had like a black background. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. But I'm so surprised, you know, that, <laughs> that they lent it out. I remember, I don't know how many years ago, but when it was back where it originated, at one point, it was uh, the guy with the hammer. The guy took a hammer to it, if I remember correctly, many years ago. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. A terrorist type guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, since I, I think it, it got to the um, World's Fair, I mean, as I said, Pope John XXIII, who was well loved um, by everybody, you know. Uh, probably gave it, you know, gave his quote unquote blessing to it. And that was a big part of it. All right. Um, we're going to move on just briefly a bit. Everybody okay at this point? Um, before going on to corporate and uh, American exhibit, I want to talk about eating. You could eat at every pavilion, you could sample foods of Spain. Belgium with the waffles, of course. Uh, you could have food in Taiwan. You could have food in pretty much every African pavilion, every pavilion around, including domestic, corporate. I mean, that was a big thing. But one of the uh, most featured eateries was Seven Up, of all things. Now. Seven Up had the sign there, which was 107 feet high, so it stood out. Um, the it was you could see it from where the Unisphere was, and it was one of places people would say, "Well, meet me by this under the Seven Up sign," because you could see that pretty much from all around, and people would gather there. Well, if they're going to gather there, they could go to the Seven Up International Sandwich. Excuse me, as I lose gardens. So they had their own gardens there. I won't call them gardens. And you could sample food specialties of 16 countries, in a, and they had elaborate uh, sandwiches. And the sandwiches were, whoops, there's the menu. Uh, you could get, I couldn't get it any better, but obviously, I'll tell you a little about the sandwiches, but you had Northern European. Pacific, Mediterranean, and the Americas. So representatives, representative of the countries who were there. It wasn't expensive to eat there, but the perk, if you ate there, you could drink all the seven up you want. Obviously you had to pay for a cup or something like that. But once you did that, you could, you know, have all the seven up you wanted. Um, some of the sandwiches that they had was a sliced lamb on a barley bread, uh, a lomi lomi salmon, salmon on a loa coconut bread. I'm not sure that sounds great to me. And prosciutto and provolone on a sesame bread. That I'd probably eat. But I can't, I couldn't make out the everything else. But while you're eating, there was a five-piece ensemble playing show tunes of all things and European and Latin music. And the platters, which you got the sandwich on with the relishes and the cheese and candy were about a buck 55. That was one of, that's, again, as I said, there were many other foods, but now, not only were you could eat food, you had court, the corporate world 
selling their products, whether they be uh, breakfast cereal or um, deli meats or hot dogs, you had tie-ins with the World's Fair in selling their products. This is the Crunchosphere, an exhibit of the world's crunchiest things, which is about to be dedicated by Cap'n Crunch himself. Ahoy, friends, I... This exhibit features the Crunchosaurus, here a Crunchodactyl, and this is a Crunchotortoise. On this great occasion... Every one of these beasts is now extinct because they couldn't find anything crunchy enough to eat. They should have known about Cap'n Crunch cereal. It's made crunchy out of corn and oats. And already sweetened with two kinds of sugar. But does it stay crunchy even in milk? Even in milk. I hereby dedicate this. Forever sweet and crunchy. I thank you. Why don't you get a bassoon? Try all three delicious Cap'n Crunch cereals. Cap'n Crunch, Cap'n Crunch with Crunch Berries, and Cap'n Crunch's peanut butter cereal. So you didn't have to be at the fair to tie in your product to um, to the fair. I, I don't remember a Captain Crunch pavilion. Of course, Captain Crunch is still around and the fair is not, so enough said. All right, now you had, which made up, which were probably more of the bigger buildings at the World's Fair, you had, um, corporate ones and some American ones. This is the Bell Pavilion, as they used to call it, uh, you know, Bell Telephone. Now Bell Telephone got broken up, there's Verizon here, something there. And it had probably one of the best spots. Um, it was down from the main mall near the, far, the fountains um, of the fair. And at a couple of levels, the lower levels had tech exhibits, including um, something you could automatically or digitally play a tic-tac-toe. Um, obviously, it predated Pong as a video game, but you could do that. And visitors could go inside, sit in chairs, and they sat in moving chairs, and saw a series of man's progress in communicating. They had, it was a, a show that had 3D effects. It had music, it had narration, which many of the um, pavilions did. They moved people around, obviously, the standing, if you couldn't get as many people in and out as quickly. And the guests also could use something that uh, started back then, but has, I think we all use today in another form. That's the picture phone. You can do this on your cell phone. That's what the picture phone looked like. Now it's 1964, okay? If you look, okay, so this is the picture phone they hope one day would be a big seller. But if you look right here, you have a touch tone phone. This touchtone phone was one of the first ones because it was introduced by Bell five months earlier in November of 63. So this was something new. Being old like me, I still remember the rotary phone that if you made a mistake, you had to start all over. Even on a touchtone phone, you had to start all over. Now you just erase your character on your cell phone and put it in the right one. Now, on this picture phone, the guests who came in to try it out could see others calling from booths within the pavilion, but they also had people they could speak to. Obviously, they didn't know them or they did know them, but more than likely they didn't, from Disneyland out in California. And there was a prediction that uh, eventually... <clears throat> everyone would have one of these in their home. Well, we all have cell phones, but I don't know if anybody who has a picture, the Bell picture phone sitting in their house. If you do, it's a collector's item and you can make yourself very rich. Um, 
a lot of the um, exhibits and provisions were hooked to science. This is DuPont and their wonderful world of chemistry. Doesn't seem like something most people going to a fair want to know about chemistry, <clears throat> but it had a review. It had a physical, musical, live people review called, as I said, the wonderful world of chemistry. They had two theaters. And in those two theaters, they showed, uh, they had two troops who did it and they were shown simultaneously. So obviously more people in, more people out. And after the show, they had a alchemist who showed some, what they called chemical wizardry. I don't know what type of, I won't call them tricks because, you know, they're not tricks. They, he did chemistry, so I don't know exactly what he did. But here's a representative or representatives of one of these shows. They did songs, they did dances about the evolution of chemistry. Not easy to pull off. Uh, costumes, you know, I don't know what they are, but uh, um, and the, the evolution of chemistry that they did in the show was from ancient Greece to present day in 1964. And every one of these costumes um, was made from fibers made by guess who? DuPont. So, you know, another way of, you know, letting people know, hey, you like it? We can make, we're not going to make a costume like that, but our, our, our uh, things made with our fibers are really good. I did not hear that this show ever made it to Broadway. <clears throat> Excuse me a second. I'm losing my voice here. All right. Here we have, let's see if we can, I'm looking for a, this is the Ford Pavilion, I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to see if it had anything on it. Ford Pavilion was something really cool. That I remember, right? and I'll tell you why. But if you look, Part of the ride, okay, so you got, here's the tram that people got around on, another way to get around. If you looked up here, this was part of the ride. And you can see the cars in this. So the rotunda was of the actual pavilion itself was several city blocks long. And some of the exhibits were designed by, here's the name again, Walt Disney. Um, and they showed animated displays of man's progress from um, the prehistoric times to, <clears throat> again, the space age. Here's Walt in the middle. This is Henry Ford, not the original, right over here. And guess what? There's Robert Moses again. He got around a lot. Um, and this was, I guess, on opening day. And people would get in, as you can see, there are Fords on a track. You would view the exhibit by getting in the car and it would go around the exhibit, which was cool. Everybody liked getting, riding around, you know, riding around the, uh, in a car. But <clears throat> one of the cars you could ride around was a car that was being introduced in 1964 and it was a car that they showed at the World's Fair. Coming April 17th, the unexpected, the new Ford Mustang. Bring a new kind of car. A new generation of Fords for the new breed of Americans who want stick shift action and room for four. Who collect sports car badges and trading stamps. Who want the elegance of a European touring car and till now have to settle for basic transportation. This is for them. This is Mustang. With an unexpected variety of options, Mustang is the one car that's designed to be designed by you. Get ready to meet the unexpected April 17th at your Ford dealers. 
So uh, I don't remember if, I don't think I got to sit in a Mustang. I probably wound up in a fair lane or something, but it was kind of cool going around in cars, which were all convertibles, obviously, um, uh, to, to see the year um, exhibit. Well, you got Ford, but you don't want to be outdone. This is a aerial of the General Motors Pavilion. It's always looked like, well, two parts. You take the front, the rear part with the, it, it's not a tail because it's actually curves, but you take it to about here, all the way back to there. It reminds me of the space shuttle somewhat. But then if you go over here, it reminds me of a flying saucer or the Starship Enterprise. But it was a giant building. This is the Grand Central again, right down there. Um, they called it the Futurama building. And this canopy I was talking about, right in the back or in the front actually, because that's where people are going in, was 10 stories high. Um, and the building itself was 230,000 square feet. Um, so what did they show in there? Just like everybody else, they had displays of GM science. They had research, they had engineering, um, they had auto and household products. And people would sit in individual contoured uh, seats with the speakers up at your head level on each side. And then they moved on the tracks that dipped and went up and down and around. It, it was amusing, not, you know, not to make you sick, but it's pretty cool. I don't remember ever seeing any of those uh, concept cars on the road. I, I did, as you're watching it, the word Firebird was in there. And uh, that was, I didn't look like the Firebird I knew from Pontiac, but um, and they, the ride was cool. I remember sitting in there. Now we had car companies. We also had GE um, and they had a place called Progress Land. Um, it showed electricity, it showed electricity from the beginning to a nuclear fusion. And they had a demo of the nuclear fusion. And guess who produced this one? Uncle Walt did this one too. Uh, the audience got to be seated, <clears throat> excuse me. 
and they go through a number of stages. And they had <clears throat> reflecting mirrors, they had visuals, they had sound, and they projected all this. And then when you got to the end, they had someone who would do, <clears throat> excuse me, I was doing, I think, um, the ending showed neutron counters. They actually had neutron counters to demonstrate controlled nuclear fusion. Uh, no meltdown, so that was good. And as I said, it was called Progress Land. And if you notice, a Walt Disney production. I don't think Walt got any money for any of this stuff, but. Uh, and 238 guests admitted every four minutes. And so 40,000 people went to their 45 minute show. And again, this is one of the ones that had really long lines. Um, and after the, people would really stretch around. It was summer, it was hot. You even saw the waiting time, if you notice up here. It's, it's my mouse. Hello, mouse. There we are. The waiting time, which is nice. It's only 20 minutes, which isn't too bad. Probably wait longer if you go to Disney World. But what they did was in 1965 portion of the fair, they put some covered waiting area so they could keep the people out of the sun. Now, this is representative of what you would see as you were on the ride. You have a kitchen, you have a gentleman in his smoking jacket and his pipe. You have the stove, you have the dog, you have the pump here. And what it was, <clears throat> they called this the carousel theater. And it used, this gentleman spoke through Disney's audio animatronics, which you know went on to be used in many, many different things. <clears throat> and they had, <clears throat> excuse me again, uh, in different stages, um, 200, the auditoriums held 250 people in each auditorium and it wrote, you rotated around. And they showed this home in the 90s, it showed the home in the 1900s, the 1920s, the 1940s and the 1960s. Um, and as you rotated, each stage, the appliances, the clothes, the furnishings changed to match that period. Uh, only, and the family, only things that didn't change were the father. So he would look different, say, in the 1960s or the 1940s. And the dog, which they didn't have to worry about changing. He was still the dog. Um, but they did change, because he spoke about it. The, the father spoke about the speaking, the dog's name changed um, <clears throat> in each different stage and period of life um, to common dog names used during that time. I don't know, you know, I do not know the, if everybody called their dog in the 1900s Fido or they called it in the 1940s Butch, but they changed and that's the only thing. And he spoke about the wonders and the wonderful stuff electricity does. Now this one you should be able to tell. This is the IBM pavilion. Um, we had in that, this was an egg shaped pavilion. It had a, um, had a movie. It had exhibits on the ground floor. And the big draw was a movie called Think, which was in a screen 90 feet overhead. <clears throat> now on the building itself, the word IBM is repeated over 4,000 times. And can anyone take a guess and what, why they use this and what it looks like? You have to be my age to remember this kind of stuff. If you ever used an IBM Selectric typewriter, which had the little ball, 
that you placed in there. That's what this looks like. <clears throat> Inside the theater, it, the movie was projected on 22 separate screens and also had a live host. The, the 22 images were not projected simultaneously. So you, you have to be looking around. They bring one up, bring another up, fade out to the other one. This is what it looked like inside. So you're looking up, you're sitting in rows like stadium seating and you're looking up. In most cases, you're looking up. This one, this woman here seems like she saw something better and so did she, but everybody else seems to be looking up at the screen. This was called a people wall. I had 500 seats and after you were seated <clears throat> in, you know, as I said, it looks like bleachers, the entire wall rise up in the theater. But before the wall went up, a tuxedo, the host, as I said, comes down from above on a platform and he was in a tuxedo and he came down from the roof on a pedestal, which was hydraulically went up and down. So it's kind of cool. I mean, you know, again, this is the sixties. You really haven't seen anything like that at all. One of the exhibits that stood out to me and you could see from all over was Kodak. Now, how could you see, why would you see it? Well, look at right up on top. <clears throat> they had five color photos. They were 30 feet by 36 feet and they were illuminated both day and night. So you could see that pretty much anywhere on there. The tower itself was 80 feet tall. And the prints that they do it, these were actual photographs they were doing in here. They changed them every four weeks. Um, Kodak's purpose was threefold at the fair. Um, they wanted to show people the experience you get from photography, not digital, real film photography. Um, they also wanted to show scenes from on the spot picture taking. So people who took pictures at the fair might, they might wind up on the carousel, I'll call it. And they wanted to show the influence of photography on modern life, on, in science, again back to science, in leisure, in industry, in medicine, and things like that. <clears throat> it had a 23 min, uh, 23 minute color movie called The Searching Eye. And it was projected in 70 millimeters, which is you know, something for the day. And what it was, was a child eye view of usual and unusual wonders of the world. And what I found interesting too, was there was music with it. And the music was composed by Elmer Bernstein, Elmer Bernstein, no connection to me. Uh, and if you don't know who Elmer Bernstein is, just watch the Magnific Magnificent Seven. And he did the music for that with, along with a lot of other uh, movies. Now, again, as other places did, it also promoted Kodak with commercials. This summer, as never before, people from almost everywhere are going places doing things, and saving the fun in color pictures. Here at the beautiful Kodak Pavilion of the New York World's Fair, for example, everyone is fascinated and entertained. And they're finding lots of ideal opportunities to take pictures they'll enjoy again and again. There's even a new camera, the Kodak World's Fair flash camera made for the occasion. At the fair, or wherever you go this summer, you can enjoy your good times over and over again if you save them in pictures. And remember, moments like these deserve the superb quality of dependable Kodak film. When you buy film, look for the name Kodak on the box. It's your assurance of quality and lasting memories. Before we move on, uh, when was the last time you used film camera? I haven't used one for still, I have several. Everybody uses digital these days. 
And who can tell me? I'm sure, Tony, you might be able to. Who was the celebrity in the Kodak commercial? Oh, holy mackerel. I don't know. Can't that, remember. That was Emmett Kelly. Emmett Kelly was one of the renowned ca uh, clowns yeah. uh, when, when circuses were actually out there. And he was in movies, he was in everything. So obviously they got him involved with Kodak and uh, made a commercial. So here we got Pepsi-Cola. And here's something, this is where, if you've been to Disney and the song in the beginning as we were waiting, It's a Small World, this was tied in with Walt and Pepsi-Cola at the World's Fair. Um, it was a salute to the children of the world. And it was a last minute addition to the fair. <laughs> Probably one of the biggest things you could see, but it was a last minute and the funds went to UNICEF, which was the you know children's fund. Um, as I said, it's now, it was, one of the most popular ones. And if you go to the Disney theme parks, you will can get in the boat and see the dolls singing. And um, they did charge, as I said, because you can see people here buying tickets over here too. But all the money went to UNICEF. Um, and th that was another one that just uh, had long lines also. And if this looks familiar, you went in small boat, just like you do in Disney World. And they sang as you went around. And you know, I didn't see anybody throw themselves from the boats. Um, but obviously, from 1964 to this day, that song sticks in a lot of people's minds. It was well done. And if you go to the, the Disney World or whatever, Things really haven't changed that much in, in almost uh, 60 years. S.C. Johnson, Johnson Wax, had a, had, a, uh, had a pavilion. It had a, this gold disc right here. Um, was floating, supposedly. It did have other things, but it was because it had, look, you, know, you can see from the stanchions here, it was floating 24 feet above the ground and it was supported by the columns that went around. It held a 500 seat theater. A lot of these places had theaters and it showed a documentary movie called um, Unbrotherhood. Um, the ground level in the exhibition area had a climbing contraption. Kids could climb on stuff. It had a home care information center. So, you know, I'm not going to be sexist. Men and women could find about cleaning products. Now, again, they're hyping their own products. And if you wanted, you could get free shoe shines there. Um, and it did have a movie. And that movie was called To Be Alive. Um, and one of the things about the movie is 20 minute, a 20 minute documentary, short subject documentary. And um, in 1964, <clears throat> it won the Academy Award for short subject documentary. And again, it was seeing the world through a child's eye. So after the fair was over, whoops. I go on there. After the fair was over, that, that gold disc actually was moved to Johnson's. Johnson's Wax was at, uh, headquarters is in Racine, Wisconsin. Um, and if you ever happen to be in Racine, you can still see the movie To Be Alive, which I found pretty cool. All right, here's the U.S. Pavilion. Boy, the other pavilions look much nicer than this. This looks like, you know, just a rectangular building. I mean, it's, it's, it's got the mound underneath it and things like that, but 
It was all right. It, it had a, um, it was called a challenge to greatness. And it focused on the great society proposals. The great society was legislation and programs that uh, President Johnson was promoting and getting through Congress. Um, it had a 15 minute ride um, through film presentations of American history, which is apropos to the US Pavilion. And you sat in moving grandstands in there and you went past movie screens to see what was going on. One of the places I found interesting was the US Space Park, because I'm a big space nut. Um, it was a effort by NASA and the Defense Department, and it covered two acres. One of the happier when you've got stuff there. And a full-scale model of engines of the Saturn V rocket, which should be right here. You had a Titan II with a Gemini capsule. You had a Atlas rocket with a Mercury capsule. You can tell the difference because this is a lot capsule a lot smaller. You had a command module in that. You had the real Aurora 7 capsule, which was flown by um, Scott Carpenter, who was the second man to orbit the Earth from the United States, John Glenn being the first. Prior to John Glenn, you had Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom do suborbital flights. And they had a lot of other exhibits. You've got to look like right here. Right here is the command module for Apollo, because that's the actual. And you've got the LEM. The lunar module, they landed on the moon. These are uh, replicas. Um, and this was 1964, so you're still five years away from the first moon landing. One of the fun exhibits, now we're away from, you know, the actual big buildings and everything like that, was Dino Land. Sinclair, the gas people, gasoline people, had a, a exhibit called Dino Land, the exciting world of dinosaurs. And it showed life from 165 million years ago. It had life-size replicas of um, nine, five, they were made out of fiberglass dinosaurs with three of them actually being able to move. I don't know if Uncle Walt was involved with this or not. And each of the dinosaurs sat in the terrain and in the, uh, let's call it the flora or the fauna, whatever they want to call it, of their time when they were actually on the earth. And people would stroll through there yeah, and look at them and uh, learn. Now, these dinosaurs were made by a sculptor called. Lewis Paul Jonas, and he lived in upstate New York. So once they were created, he had to get them down to New York City, Queens. Well, you're not gonna put them in the back of a flatbed truck or in a covered truck, so how'd they get him down? Put them on a barge, run them down the river. Now this to me looks like Riverside Church, possibly here, I'm not sure, but it might be. But here's the dinosaurs on their way to the World's Fair. And they barged them all the way down. Hopefully it was good weather. One of the other interesting things you could do with the fair, and it was a ride. US Royal is really Uniroyal now. And they had a Ferris wheel that looked like a tire. Uh, created by the U.S. Rubber Corp. Uh, company. It was 80 feet high. It weighed 12 tons. And it was anchored in 24 feet of concrete and steel. And so they said it could uh, withstand hurricane force winds. There was a fee, uh, you know, a fee to go on it, but you got to go around. The tires, so you again, you got a view. Well, 
what happened after the after the fair was over? Well, here's the modified tire now. Uh, it's the it's at the U.S. or Uniroyal uh, headquarters, which is um, outside it's outside Detroit in Allen Park, Michigan. It's right by uh, Interstate 94. And since '66, it's been there. Can't take a ride, as you can see. Look, the tire now is a real tire. Um, it was the, the original tire was disassembled. Shipped in 22 tucks to Michigan to be reassembled here, where it's still on display. Um, I don't know what they did with the passenger gondolas. There was also Abraham Lincoln was at the fair. He was in the Illinois pavilion. Again, this was uh, a free pavilion. We had Uncle Walt back in because Abe Lincoln spoke. Um, the name of the show was Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln. And as I said, Walt Disney did another one of his animatronics. Um, and what Abe did, didn't sit down, but he just sat there and spoke. But he recited things, excerpts from uh, many of his speeches. And it said, I couldn't prove this, but... Lincoln was capable of over 250 uh, combos, combinations of actions, smiles, gestures, things like that. So I really didn't know uh, exactly about that. On the right here, we have the world's largest cheese. It's 34,591 pounds. That's all, okay, it's uh, over 17 times. It has many ribbons, and you can see, I was going to ask you a question, but you can see, it's from the Wisconsin Pavilion. Uh, couldn't find them what they, you know, did they make uh, grilled cheese sandwiches after the fair was over? Uh, was it refrigerated? Uh, I'm not sure. I just found the world's largest cheese at that time being at the fair. Um, if the cooling system broke down, they'd have bad cheese, but I found that to be a Interesting exhibit. Now this head large bottle of wine. There. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, they 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 could have they could have taken the cheese, uh, got together with I don't know Gallo, and Nabisco could have had Ritz crackers there, and they can put them all together. <laughs> well, this one's is is um, it's still out there, as you can tell. Well, you can't tell, but it's, it's out there, not in the condition it shows now. This is the New York State Pavilion. Um, it's an open air pavilion. It had restaurants. It had um, the tent of tomorrow, as they called it. And these uh, columns supported it. They were 100 feet tall. It had the observation tower here and here and here. You could go and see it. And the main floor, if you went down, they used it really for um, local artists to show their work and for industry displays. And unfortunately, it fell into disrepair. I think they're working on it now, but it fell into disrepair after um, the fair was over, which is unfortunate as many of the um, Exhibits didn't, or they were dismantled. Um, the problems we had with this, uh, now I'm not gonna dwell on this, but as the fair was closing, um, it ended up in, when it was ending, it was ended in controversy. Um, the 1939 fair returned to its investors and to, uh, the bond investors it returned 40 cents on the dollar. This fair returned only 19 cents on the dollar. And here's a little something about why this fair was not in a success financially. As we said earlier, it needed 70 million people to break even. Didn't get close to that. Um, there were allegations of financial mismanagement uh, the Fair Corporation, um, which was the one that 
Robert Moses headed up. They booked millions in advance sale for the fair for both seasons. But then they took that money, that was prior to 65, they took that money and they put it against expenses only for the first year. So they didn't have the money to pay off the second year. Attendance was below expectations. They had trouble paying their bills and they almost, I'm not sure if they did, but they almost went into bankruptcy. Um, I mean, I had a great time and to the average person, it really didn't matter, but um, it was not the financial success that, it, that it, people thought it might be. It looks more like a gala opening than a closing, but closing it is for the New York World's Fair. It has been visited by 51 million people, nearly half a million of whom are here today. To keep for future millennia the memory of this fair and of the world it caught in essence, a time capsule is to be sunk 50 feet beneath the earth alongside the one buried at the previous World's Fair a quarter of a century ago. Newsreel film, as well as voices and writings of leaders of these decades are placed in it, along with antibiotics, credit cards, a ballpoint pen, a bikini bathing suit, and yes, even a Beatles record. A seven-ton granite marker will be placed above the site. The button is pressed that starts the mechanism to lower the steel container. Then it disappears for 5,000 years. Attendance on the final night breaks all previous records, but it's still not enough to bring the profits to their estimated figure. The city park, planned for the Flushing Meadow site, will have to be somewhat less magnificent than originally projected. Thousands who pack the boulevards, the plazas, and the pavilions on this farewell night are not concerned with what will be here next. They are here to make the most of what's so fleetingly here now, before the flags are lowered for the last time. of the visitors depart and the New York World's Fair becomes a memory or a record in a time capsule. I have one more actual thing to show you. Um, as you can see, the fair has ended, but the fair never really ended because if you remember what I'm about to show you, the fair was still around and not used by earthlings. All right, we'll just post our level five and sets on the composing factor. What? Just shoot the damn thing on account of one, two, three. Little did we know back in the 60s, we went to the fair, it was all alien technology that did the New York State Pavilion. Um, I thank you for visiting the fair with me. Because when you step back in time, I hope you had fun. I hope we brought back or gave you an insight to the fair and what was there. There are plenty of things out on the internet. There are books. There's a lot of video on the internet, so if you want to visit more of the fair, please do. I know I, I, I keep looking up stuff that I may not have seen before. 
Questions? Comments? Before I, well, I we, yeah. We felt like we were there again. Yeah, it was fun. I mean, you know, and you know, uh, those are the kind of things. If if if, if uh, I could go into um, Sherman and Peabody's for those of you know Sherman and Peabody's Wayback Machine, I would go back for a day to the World's Fair. I hear you. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Sherman and Peabody were cartoon characters. The dog was a smart one. <laughs> um, yes. Popping up here and there. Um, just to let you know, there are no programs in September. I'm actually taking the month off. To, um, two weeks ago, I had uh, glaucoma eye surgery, so I'm kind of just going to take it easy in September and hopefully uh, let it get a bit back to normal. Um, and so we're not, there may be a program or two uh, that someone else is doing, Caitlin's working, our director's working on, but uh, the program that was supposed to be the next one in Maywood's history, it was supposed to be, we were doing one in October, one in November, one in September, one in October, excuse me. We're gonna do one in October and one in November instead. So uh, I'll still keep my hand in it somewhat, but I'm going to kind of just, Take it easy. Um, and if you, just as, as an aside, I do work, <laughs> I'm not giving this up, bro. I do work, if you like historical sites, um, there is a Revolutionary War site in Stony Point, New York, where a battle was fought in um, July of 1779. There's a fort and lighthouse up there on weekends. I'm one of the interpreters and guides in starting tomorrow, I'll be in 18th century dress. Um, so if you're interested in history, uh, it's free to get in and uh, you can look it up on the internet. Anything else before I say good night? Great job as usual and rest up and take care of yourself. Yep, we'll see you everybody in October. Sounds like a plan. All right, be well, stay well. Okay. Bye. I feel like I'm. Does she feel like